Hi, welcome to our second session in our module on social psychology. And today we will talk about person perception, how we form impression of others, which processes under and which factors influences and which processes underlie this formation of our impressions. But before I get all scientific on you, before we look at evidence and theories, I would like you to kind of maybe take a little glimpse into how you form impressions of others. Take a look at this um, gentleman here and maybe take out a piece of paper or your phone and write down what your first impressions are of that person. I know we shouldn't judge a book by its cover but now I give you permission and say please do. Please just write down uh, whatever comes to your mind and try not to focus too much on his appearance. Try not to focus too much uh, kind of naming things that are uh, obvious like he has a gray beard uh, or he wears glasses, but try to think a little bit about his psychological profile. Maybe you want to uh, pause the video for a moment and just write that down. And when you're done, you can proceed. Person perception is often kind of situated within this larger field, what is called in social psychology, social cognition. Social cognition is quite awkwardly to deep it's quite awkward to define and have a perfect definition of that. And we will go through uh, the upcoming three more lectures and kind of try to wrestle a little bit with that. Here are two definitions. I'll read out the shorter one on the bottom. Social cognition analyzes the steps and people's train of thought about other people. So social cognition is social thinking, right? Cognition is just a fancy word for thinking. And it kind of tries to understand how we think about other people. Um, I think it's easier to understand why social cognition plays such a dominant role within social psychology when we look at from a historical perspective. Sometimes, believe it or not, the history of psychology actually offers really good cues about uh, why we focus on certain topics or why we study certain things the way we are. So here are three uh, gentlemen again, and the three of them, I'm a little bit on Noam Chomsky's face, let me make myself in uh, a smaller. So here on the, on the top, you see um, John Watson, right? John Watson was um, basically the founding father of behaviorism. You had that, you know that by now already, uh, all about uh, behaviorism, right? And you know that basically the key idea of behaviorism is that it rejects your and my ability to accurately report what is going on in my mind, why I behave in a way that I behave. And so what they did is like, hence, we shouldn't look into the black box. We should only analyze kind of the stimulus that goes in and the response that goes out. There are still many um, psychologists who endorse a form of behaviorism such that they do not trust our ability to introspect. I'm one of these psychologists. I don't think that we can often learn a lot by asking people. But this was in very stark contrast to what happened in the 40s and 50s uh, to psychology. A, a lot of, as I uh, talked about in the last lecture, a lot of um, uh, uh, European psychologists, scientists had to flee Europe because of the Nazis in the 30s and 40s, and they came to America. And behaviorism was something very American. So now all these European scientists came in, all these European psychologists came in, such as Kurt Levine, the founding father of experimental social psychology, and they were not as cozy with behaviorism and with these ideas. Um, you see here Noam Chomsky often kind of cited as one of the turning points within psychology in particular for why we adapted what then became known as cognitive psychology. Noam Chomsky, and you had all of that in the history of psychology, uh, demonstrated that the principles of behaviorism are not enough to understand fully um, uh, uh, the human mind our mind and behavior, and hence the methods are too limited. We have to extend them. And one key idea is that we use cognition, we use people's thinking in order to explain their behavior, and it should be allowed to ask them about their thinking. And so cognitive psychology, starting in the 40s and 50s, became hugely influential and successful. Hence, social psychologists also thought, oh, there's this new tool of analyzing social behavior. Maybe we should apply it to our own field as well. And that's what they did, right? And you will see that in the upcoming lectures. And you will see that today, how social cognition is uh, strongly influenced by cognitive psychology. Okay. 
So hence, uh, the kind of like the approach to understanding human behavior was for or social behavior for for a very long time, uh, kind of heavily inspired by social uh, by cognitive psychology, which then which branch became known as social cognition. So we have social cognition. There are two main problems that social cognition or cognitive psychology has to handle and grapple with that really inform the way we see uh, people, the way we try to understand the human mind. On the left side, you see information overload. There is so much information coming in that we have to put in some filters, right? Uh, think about like when you learn about attention, when you learn about memory, when you learn about perception. It is all about filtering information down. We have to kind of find pattern within this big inflow of information, right? We have to find some kind of way to handle this information overload. And the other one, which is really important for social psychology, is uncertainty. Often I do not know, really, I don't have full information about a person, about a situation, about another group, etc. So think about the person that you looked at, the old gentleman in the beginning of this little short video here, right? We don't know who he is. We have to try to, if we want to interact with him, we need to kind of make sense of him, try to understand him better. And hence, I have to find ways to reduce the uncertainty and then act upon that. In psychology in general and in social psychology in particular, there are three kind of different related responses trying to explain how people handle A, the information overload and be the resulting um, uh, uh, and be the uncertainty. All of them you can find in any type of uh, psychology as well, but they're oh, most of them emerged from social psychology and became very influential, right? The first one is the idea of the cognitive miser. So just as a miser doesn't want to spend any money, you and I, so uh, uh, that's at least what uh, Susan Fisk on the left and Charlie Taylor on the right think. So they're not just old men in social psychology, they're super influential uh, 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 female researchers as well, especially Susan Fisk and Shelley Taylor, to this day, super influential in social psychology. But coming back, they said like, okay, how do people handle this excessive information overload? They're cognitive misers. They use schemata and shortcuts and heuristics and other things in order to drive down, to reduce um, the uh, uh, information and kind of make it handleable. Okay. So we are cognitive misers. We do not want to uh, exert much cognitive influence. So we look for kind of simple and easy ways to handle these situations. Very important when we think about person perception in particular, but also one of the really fundamental truths, I think, about humans, that we are cognitive misers. The other one is uh, this kind of like here, you see Kahneman and Tversky, right? Uh, they wrote uh, many, many influential papers and one book that they edited here, uh, Judgment Under Uncertainty. They identified certain heuristics and biases that we use in order to handle uncertainty. So here it was not so much to focus on the um, the information overload, but here was actually the focus on the lack of information that we often have if we want to make a decision, right? Uh, if you want to hire a person and you look at them, you don't know whether they will be good or not. How do I reduce this uncertainty? And their answers, I use some heuristics and biases. We come to that later on today as well, but that's also something super influential all over uh, psychology, but in social psychology in particular. The third one is this kind of idea of motivated cognition. This is a camp I would uh, myself kind of align myself with, where it's, okay, there is uncertainty and there's information overload and I have to reduce it, but I'm not just kind of like this impartial bystander. I want to uh, end at certain truths about myself or perceived truths, right? About myself and about others and the world I live in, right? You can think about as the easiest example is either here is like a kind of like a confirmation bias on a, on a picture, but you can think about it as optimism, right? We interpret information in a way that makes us feel good about ourselves and the future. And that's the key idea behind motivated cognition. So these three fields kind of, they're often, uh, it's hard to distinguish them in practice, but these three ideas are kind of really central to understanding the human mind is like the response we have to uncertainty and cognitive uh, information overload.